grew up in Cambridge County, went to Southern Maryland, had two kids, uh, worked in a nuclear power plant. Uh, while I was at the power plant, uh, I got married and some really weird things happened along the way. After about seven years, our, our marriage was failing. We lost our home. We moved into a smaller house. Uh, I was pretty upset with things. He met someone else. Mm -hmm. And trying to save our marriage, he, he felt that I had social anxiety disorder. Okay. I don't know that it's a disorder, it's just me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm one of those type of people that I am I like to be in the background. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm kind of uncomfortable with attention on me. So I'm, I'm real good at being um, the support, yeah. you know. Um, and he loved the attention and, and I was, I felt it was a good match given the fact that he liked it. Right, that he I liked didn't. the spotlight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that makes so, sense. In trying to save the marriage, I went ahead and went on this medication. In the process of taking this stuff, my moods did change. Now, I, we had lost our home. We had um, had to declare bankruptcy. So I was very uh, sad. I was, I had a lot of anxiety. I had to start over again. Right. Um, you know, we were both starting over again um, in a fixer-upper home. The kids had to be moved uh, from one county to the next, so, you know, their schools changed, and uh, my oldest one was not happy about it at all, so we had problems How old there. were they at that time? Uh, my youngest <coughs> was um, uh, seven or eight, and my older son was probably around 17 or so. He's the one that had a real hard time with it because all of his friends mm -hmm. were in the other county. Yeah, and that, yeah, it was really difficult for him and he just didn't seem to understand. We didn't want to make the move, we had no choice. Right. So um, there was the anxiety of all that. Um, then to find out that uh, my husband was having an affair, um, was mind blowing. I mean, it was just. Uh, I mean, my my head went in places where I just I couldn't cope. Um, I couldn't focus. I, I couldn't, and it got worse. Mm -hmm. When I went back to the doctors with the medication, I mean, I was in therapy, but um, the medication seemed to take me out of control. I mean, it was, it was, I don't know if you know what akathisia is. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been scared so bad that your heart just keeps racing, mm -hmm. your ears pop, your, um, you, can, you can lose your vision momentarily mm -hmm. where it goes white. Any additional sounds will like set you off. Mm -hmm. That's exactly That's what, what akathisia is like. Okay. It's, um, you're on a non-stop adrenaline rush that doesn't go away. But it's not just an adrenaline rush, it's like adrenaline terror. Mm. I couldn't sleep. My behavior became more and more bizarre. The more I thought I was losing him, and the more desperate I became, the harder it was on me, and I couldn't function. I just absolutely couldn't function. And, and my behavior got more and more bizarre. I mean, bad bizarre. And you think it was because of the medication? Oh, absolutely. As a uh, yeah, yeah. There was a couple different ones that they had put me on, and every time they would change them around, it, it, it just seemed to make things worse. Mm -hmm. And I would tell the doctor that, you know, this is happening, this is going on. And at one point, he even told me, yeah, your um, serotonin level, levels are out of whack. So he knew what was going on. But he told me that uh, it was an anxiety thing. I, it was my anxiety. And I have gone through far worse than losing a husband without medication and without that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. My husband then, um, about the last week or so, he would give me these rapid fire phone calls, you know, from work, because he would work till like three o'clock in the morning. And um, so it made things worse with my inability to sleep. So I finally just gave up. And I 
felt the best thing for my kids and my family and everybody is if I just took myself out of the picture. And um, two days before September 11, um, I decided that I was going to end my own life. I had gotten a phone call from him and he had, had informed me how I wasn't a good mother and I wasn't a good daughter and, you know, I had no friends, nobody could stand to be around me. And it was, you know, you're just overall a really bad person. And when I hung up the phone, it was like, you know, he's absolutely right. I have no friends. You know, my, my family doesn't want to be around me. My kids don't like me. The best thing I could do, I mean, I've obviously upset this older one, my older son didn't even want to be around me. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to destroy my younger son. The best thing I could do for all of them is just, you know, remove myself from the picture and, and let them then be raised better. My life insurance money will be there. And my my ex, that was, that was one of the really weird things. When we were getting our life insurance policies, the, he had asked the insurance agent if there was a suicide clause in it. Yes. So, um, and there was, it was five years prior to. And the five years was up that February. So we had now matured enough to reach the suicide clause. Right. September 9th, um, I went ahead and I called him and I told him, you can have it all. Uh, told him to use our life insurance money wisely and uh, told him where the keys, the vehicles were and everything. And I guess he called 911 and told them that he thought I was going to commit suicide. So I had sent my son out to the neighbor, but the neighbor wasn't home. So I called my husband and I told him, I'd, I'd really like for you to uh, to stop by the house and pick up my youngest son. You know, uh, Can you please call me and let me know when you're on your way? Because I knew it would only be a few minutes then before he got there. And I didn't want my son by himself or to come back in the house. I, I had run into the bathroom and um, when the police kicked the door in, I guess I, that whole thing with the acacia, it scared me. And I jumped and um, discharged the gun. So uh, because they were there and they had EMS there right away, um, they were able to stabilize me enough to get me to Baltimore to shock trauma. And um, they were able to, to, to save me. Um, it's been a long, a long journey since then, but uh, had I not been on the medication, I mean, when I woke up in the hospital, my head was clear. Mm -hmm. You know, I had had transfusions and um, it, it's just, it's just very, very strange that um, I've never, I mean, the divorce proceedings with everything then that I was left with yeah. and everything that has come since um, has been far, far worse than anything I was dealing with beforehand. Um, so you would think if, if I was really serious about doing something like that, that, I mean, I, I would have had plenty of opportunity right. since. Um, where did the gun come from, if you don't mind me asking? Well, it was in a gun locker that we didn't have a key to. Uh, it was my husband's gun locker. And um, the key had been missing for like five years. Mm -hmm. and But it was an unmistakable key. It was a, a key ring that had a, like a three fifty seven bullet on it. Sunday was the 9th. On Saturday the 8th, uh, I had gone into my nightstand. Everything had been cleared away to an area about so big, and in the very center of the very center of the space were the keys. Mm -hmm. And I called my husband at the time, and I told him I found these keys, and and I was on suicide watch. I had attempted to commit suicide at, uh, in August by taking an overdose. Um, and he was supposed to remove everything from the house. 
Um, and because and you think he put the keys there? I, I'm certain of it. I'm absolutely certain of it. Mm. But I called him and I told him this is here and it's not supposed to be here. You know, and I accused him of putting it there at the time and he said that my oldest son is so angry at me that he probably did it. And I was like, no, he doesn't have a key to the house anymore. You know, he's not staying at the home. So, but my husband was in and out of the house, you know. So it was very obvious uh, exactly what was going on. Uh, coming home from the hospital, I was in, I was in Baltimore shock trauma uh, from September till almost until October. And then in October, they moved me into the psychiatric unit. And I was in the psychiatric unit then until the 18th of October. He continued to work on me big time. To, uh, it's my understanding that he tried to have me committed to the state mental institution, but he couldn't get three doctors to sign off. I had nobody to help me, so I had to rely on him then to transport me from the hospital back home. And on the way home from the hospital, on, we, we were almost home, and because I had a trach and I wasn't able to, I had to talk by writing. He told me, you know, there's, there's one thing that really confuses me about all this. Why would you choose in your life with a gun rather than something like, you know, there are so many other ways that you could die that are so much less painful. He said, you could take a hose and put it over the exhaust pipe and just run it into the window of the car, and you would just go to sleep. <laughs> and I wrote it on the thing, my God, you're bringing me home for, from a psych ward for a suicide. You know, what are you saying? And he was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and he just passed it off. And then, so it was like, okay, this one you've got to watch. You know, this is, this is serious. You're going to have to be really careful. And so I knew the very day I was coming home from the hospital, this wasn't going to be an easy, an easy thing. The girlfriend had my son and was taking care of my son while I was in the hospital, my youngest one. Um, so I was told I really needed to be thankful to this woman because, you know, she was caring for my son while I wasn't able to. All of us have a breaking point. There is no human out there that doesn't have a breaking point. And most people aren't that cruel and um, insensitive to another person's uh, emotional state. I mean, it, there's, there's a line, there's a taboo line. You just don't cross it. But not everybody's like that, you know? And when I finally got up the strength to go and file for divorce, the court process was really revealing too. I quit counting at 60 surgeries. Um, just between the eyes and hair, everything was gone. Um, so it all had to be completely rebuilt. So I, I, I have been in and out of Baltimore shock trauma, and I, I don't know if you're aware of like the, the full facial transplants. No. Um, there's been two of them okay. have been done out of Baltimore shock trauma. There's um, where it literally, it, it's an entire face. Mm -hmm. That was my doctor. So, I mean, my doctor is really phenomenal. And he was a resident whenever I was brought in in 2001. So uh, we have been through, I, I was one of like one of his early patients with um, surgeries that have never been done before. So I'm in the medical books. His whole thing was, um, you know, do you want to try this? We, we don't have even, they don't really have like statistics that'll tell you there's X survival rate. Yeah. Well, they didn't have any because it's never been done before. I do have a really strong face, and um, my whole feeling with it was it, there has to be a purpose past this. There, I mean, it, there, there's, I was told through the process while I was in the hospital that number one, uh, people don't normally live through these. Number two, the ones who do the shock wave through your head and through the brain, 
usually doesn't make for someone who needs to eat. So the what I was giving them to work with and what I was going to need to have to for me to work um, was all completely new territory because they don't normally have patients that uh, live through it, you know. Um, and that golden hour, as they call it, was, was key because uh, whether he realizes it or not, he, he saved my life by calling, you know, for, yeah. Do you think if they hadn't knocked on the door and scared you, you would have gone through with it? I don't know. I don't know. And I've, I've kicked that around quite a bit. I, I really, I don't know. I know I stood there praying. I prayed that he would understand. He knew the pain that I was in. And that um, he would welcome me into heaven anyway. And uh, forgive me for, you know, what I knew I wasn't supposed to be doing. And lucky for me, he said no. Because of you, we now have the warnings about, you know, how medicines like that can... Well, uh can cause those kind of thoughts that you probably wouldn't have had otherwise. When I came back home and I started going to my therapist again, she had told me that um, my behavior had become so bizarre that she really felt as though I had been poisoned. She said, There's, you, it, it was as though your system had been poisoned because it was just so completely unlike you. So I started checking into the medicines that I was on. And I learned a lot about the SSRIs and uh, the suicidal ideation mm -hmm. that they tend to cause. And um, so I contacted a, uh, uh, a law office out of Washington, D.C. Because there I was on more than one medication and they were different pharmaceutical companies, that makes it more difficult. Um, and because there were so many other factors in my situation with my husband, they said that there's, there's no way that, you know, you, you could win a case like that. You just, you can't do it. Even though we're sure that that really is what allowed him to play with you so easily. The medication was a key factor in it. And, uh, but they said we have so many other cases that we're trying to take the cases that are the ones that we can win easier because it, it's a really hard challenge anyway. So I let it go. And then uh, uh, 2004, um, they contacted me and besides the Maryland, the FDA was having uh, their meeting and they were going to decide on the black box. Uh, and they had a whole bunch of people who were going to go in and talk about their experiences on the medication. And, but mostly the people who were there were parents and loved ones of people who had died yeah. and had committed suicide. I was the only survivor there to speak. Everybody else either has thought about suicide and could talk about those feelings, but they didn't attempt it. It was, it was a pretty, obviously a pretty tough council, you know, the group of people they had. It was people from the pharmaceutical company, people from the FDA, um, people that they were going to hire uh, to do um, panels to research it further, mm -hmm. which they're paid right. by, but they're paid by the pharmaceutical right. companies. Yeah. So it's like, the, it's already <clears throat> stacked. Mm -hmm. I mean, I gave my speech and I turned around and realized and how big this room was and all these people <laughs> that were there and promptly got lost. I couldn't find my way back to my seat. So I just walked, kept walking out of the room and um, I had to for the bathroom. And I went in and I came out and washed my hands and there was this woman standing there and um, 
she like checked to make sure nobody else was in the room with us and she shook my hand and said, I just really want to thank you for doing this. I know how hard it was. She said, I'm whoever, and she worked for the FDA. Oh, wow. And she, she said that they have known about this for quite some time, but um, they don't often get to meet survivors. So when we went back in, uh, they deliberated a little while, and by the end of the meeting, they decided for the black box. So, however, they didn't include, the only thing this meeting was for, they, it wasn't for adults. They were, it was strictly to help protect the kids. It, so on the label, it reads that for people under 21, young adults and children huh. is what the, bar, the warning reads. It doesn't say anything about adults, but it, it's adults it's too. Sure, yeah. It's absolutely adults. But I guess because people are, we're more sensitive of our children dying, you know. How old were you at the point when all this happened? Uh, 41. Okay. So, yeah. And, I mean, I've, I'm an emotional person. I've always been an emotional person. I'm not uh, off the deep end emotional person. You know, I, I've got, I think, a pretty good grip on coping skills, uh, even in the hardest of times. Um, I did it, I took the medication to pacify and take that off the table with him mm -hmm. so that he couldn't say, well, you weren't trying. Right. Because we were already in therapy, yeah. you know, and so it was a suggestion that, okay, yeah, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to try to fix the marriage. Yeah. And, you know, the thought of being more social wasn't a bad thought. I mean, going out and enjoying myself and groups of people is, yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. But it never did that. And actually, it made me more paranoid. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just, it, it didn't do anything that it so-called promised mm -hmm. to do. I mean, my personal um, angst with the whole thing is we're messing with people's brains, you know, and the function of their brain. How can you decide what chemical level they're on if you don't even do a blood test, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, surely there has to, they're able to tell you the serotonin level is off the roof whenever someone's dying and they do an autopsy. Why can't they do it prior to, you know? I mean... I would, I would, well, that makes sense. So that would do away with an awful lot of customers, yeah. you know. I mean, I, I just, yeah. I don't get it. <laughs> but I mean, they're, they're sacrificing so many people every year. And we're written off. We're just, we're completely written off because we're crazy. Mm. You know, we're undesirables anyway because we're mentally unstable. So... They're, they're giving people the stuff for, for anxiety, for social disorders, for um, all kinds of different things. And that was one of the things that they said at the FDA meeting was that general practitioners should not be allowed to dish out this. And that's where I got mine. So, I mean, you're having doctors who aren't even um, in the psychiatry profession dishing out the stuff for because the side effect of it can help you with something, you know? Well, that's not a good thing. And, I mean, it's, it's just flat out dangerous. It took me 10 years to wean myself off of that. If the doctors would say, okay, you know what? This is akathisia, and this is a side effect of this medicine. We need to get this taken care of. I'm not sure how, but we're going to have to tweak things, right. hang in there. You know, we, we, will, we will take care of this for you. But understand, this can cause suicide ideation, and this can cause that you're going to feel... If he would explain that to me, I wouldn't have felt like it was me. Like, all right, you, know? so you were the problem. Yeah, but I, I really felt like I was losing it, mm -hmm. and I was the problem for my family. How do you 
cope with things today? I know you have you have artwork that you do. Is that kind of your outlet? Yeah, yeah. My art is a huge outlet for me. I, I'm writing a book about uh, all of this. So those things, it actually keeps me pretty busy. But and I, I do like to cook and and do stuff for the family too, so. The biggest problem is nobody knows our bodies like us. And I'm not saying that all these medications are bad. It's just that, well, first of all, people are put on them way too quickly and way too easily for things that they don't need to be put on. Um, those pills did nothing, really, in the long run to help me, except cause problems. We think we can just take a pill and everything's going to all be okay. It doesn't work that way. We still have to work through things. I have never experienced any darkness, any low, as deep and consuming and hopeless as that place that I was in on that medication. The, the number of people who told me I was selfish was amazing. It's not selfish. I think the vast majority of people who commit suicide, I think kind of fall into the same kind of place I was at, where they just can't pull out of it. It, it literally is a black hole. It, it has a hold on you like a suction, and it just keeps pulling you and pulling you deeper and deeper inside of it. The only thing I wish I would have thought about at the time is even a black hole has another side and it's going to it's going to release you back into light, you know? There is hope. And for anybody, anybody at all who is there, if you can hold on for six months, give yourself six months of trying to claw at it and work at it and struggle through it. I think at the end of that six month period, they'll find that things have started to turn around for themselves. It's all about one step at a time, every single day, one step at a time.